Good morning. I hope, in a reverse kind of a way, that I shocked you yesterday with our revelations of the conditions in far too many of the personal care homes and private homes in British Columbia. Just remember what the government official in charge of the program told us, told us very frankly, I must give Isabel Kimmett full credit. She told us that conditions were filthy in some of the rest homes, that there had been outbreak of scabies, that the staffing was poor, that the handling of trust accounts for patients was very bad indeed, and she gave us a whole litany of absolute disaster. The unauthorized laundry charging, the refusal of some operators to pay back what was patent overcharging, the purchase of furnishings in one place with residents' money, and all kinds of mishandlings of medications. Truly a shocking and appalling situation. As I said yesterday, I don't blame the government so much for the fact that they rushed in the program at $6.50 a day. That had to come. But what I do blame is the apathy of many members of the public who must know of these things and do not make the complaints, even though there are 188 complaints under review right now. I am convinced that there are many more to be found. Yesterday I spoke to the association for the BC Association of Private Care Homes and the executive director told me rather chillily that he didn't want to comment on this situation until he saw it in print. I told the gentleman who has his offices in Victoria that he'd better get in touch with Isabel Kimmett because it wasn't merely Webster's reporting which brought this to your attention. The government is well aware of the situation. So I urge you, not in any light way or any second-hand hearsay way, if you have knowledge of lack of attention, lack of care, overcharging, poor conditions for our older people and some younger people too in personal care homes, please put your complaints in writing to Isabel Kimmett, K-I-M-M-I-T-T, -T, Long Term Care Victoria. And if you wish, and I shall treat it initially on a confidential basis, send a copy to Jack Webster at BCTV, Post Office Box 4700 in Burnaby. Because the measure of the civilization of a society is how it treats its old people. And we obviously have all been apathetic and slack and couldn't care less in our attitude. One final word on that topic. I am not saying that all private hospitals uh, society institutions or personal care homes are guilty of this neglect. Many of them are very good indeed. Many of them are excellent. Many of the investigations perhaps involve one isolated incident in an otherwise excellent institution. But it's entirely up to the public to put the pressure on where they know things are wrong to make sure the government doesn't only have three investigators as it now has, but if necessary has 30, 40 or 40 50 investigators to check every case, every care home in British Columbia. That's that. Now for today. It's not, uh, the second part of the program is not the happiest program in the world. We are going to do our contribution to Alcohol Awareness Week, but we're not going to be nice Nelly about it. We're not going to say alcohol is a drug, alcohol drips into your poison. We're going to show you the ghastly effects of alcohol. Again, if you don't want to be shocked, take your eyes off the television set for the next uh, minute and a half. Because I sent my reporter, Brian Coxford, uh, down to the Vancouver drunk tank for two nights. That's the drunk tank on the fifth floor of the police uh, lockup in Vancouver. Brian, of course, was there sober as a reporter. That man there, he would appear to have a severe medical problem. He is a drunk. And we'll tell you why he's behaving like that. And it's merely part of the massive problem that we have in Vancouver on the way we treat alcoholics in, I might say, the wrong manner. Now, for the other part of the program, I think you will enjoy it, and that's what we're going to start with. The Premier who, in my opinion, was one of the dominating figures at the Constitutional Conference, self-effacing kind of man by the name of Alan Blakeney. I interviewed him at the Socialist International Congress at the weekend, and I asked him what future Trudeau had.
I, I predict that Mr. Trudeau will not be Prime Minister after the next election. That, that either because the Liberals change their leader or alternatively because Clark is elected and, uh, and either could happen and uh, uh, I think you're probably right. Mr. Clark is probably going to be elected. Uh, but uh, with respect... To now down to business with the only NDP Premier in the country, Alan Blakeney. I spent a fair amount of time over the weekend at the 14th Socialist International Congress in the Hyatt Regency. A lot of big noises there. Fortunately, I managed to get hold of the only NDP Premier in the country, Alan Blakeney, and I tried to get him to gloat over his destruction recently of the Liberals. Okay, Mr. Blakeney, uh, at this Socialist Democratic International Congress, it's surely appropriate that I interview as the Cock of the walk of the Social Democrats in Canada. Will you take a bow? Thank you, Jack. Uh, it's nice to be here, and uh, nice to be here after having won an election. That's right. I <laughs> want you to tell me. I want you to gloat a little bit about yeah. your election. Just tell me what you did this time out. Well, we, we ran a campaign based upon uh, uh, what I would call democratic socialist issues, you know, control of resources and... Uh, uh, that, that had a couple of aspects, clearly, you know, public control of resources. That's not, the, that's not the answer I want. Who was Prime Minister in 1971 in Saskatchewan? Oh, a, a man by the name of Ross Thatcher. The, uh, had he not been at one time a, a socialist, Social Democrat himself? Yet, yes, indeed. He'd been a CCF uh, a member of Parliament. He was a turncoat. He went liberal. Well, he, yes, he, he went liberal. I won't give him any labels, but... <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Blatney, what did you do to the liberals this time? Well, uh, it was, uh, they got caught in the buzzsaw and they came out with no seats. That's the first time in the history of Saskatchewan that the li there have been no Liberals elected to the legislature. So the majority of Thatcher's Liberal in 19, Liberals in 71 are now how many seats in Saskatchewan? 61 in all, and there were about 58 or 59 then. And uh, Ross Thatcher in 71 had about 34, I believe, and now they're down to zero. But zero? None at all? None at all. Do they have a leader? Well, uh, he, uh, currently a leader, but I don't know whether he will continue as leader. Oh, the Liberals are better off here. They've got one member in the House who has announced he's going to quit. Yeah. <laughs> so they're stronger here than they are in Saskatchewan, yes, well, aren't they? That's right. In, in Alberta, they have none, and in, in Manitoba, they have one. So they've got a total of two in the legislatures in the prairies. And you, and now, I, described as one of the most self-effacing and modest uh, premiers in all of Canada, now have a veritable steamroller. Well, uh, we have a, a working majority of... Uh, what is <laughs> that working majority? Uh, uh, we have 44 and the opposition has 17, and that's a happy situation if you're a politician. Who are the opposition? The, the Tories? The uh, Conservatives, yeah. Well, of course, you must confess that the Supreme Court of Canada handed to you on a platter a simple issue which perhaps uh, strengthened your kind of weaker position before that decision, did it not? Oh yeah, I th no doubt. We were running on resources. Uh, we were trying to emphasize the fact that we were... And our, our party was the one which would protect resources against the grasping hand of Ottawa. Uh, that's inelegantly put, but th that's sort of what it amounts to. And uh, then uh, the Supreme Court came along with a decision which uh, suggested that uh, our, our, a law which had been uh, working when the, when the Liberal government was in power unchallenged, uh, but which had been attacked after we came to office, was invalid. And uh, that uh, perhaps strengthened the idea that somehow someone was... Uh, was, was trying me, to get our resources. Let me try and put the issue to you. You were able to go out in the hustings and say, this Supreme Court in Ottawa has just ruled that we, the people of British Columbia, cannot control our basic resources. We cannot set a rate of production on our potash. Is that right? That's right. It was, uh, we didn't phrase it in terms of British Columbia, but the, but the uh, principle is the same all across Canada. And uh, the, uh, we were just saying that, that the import of this is that no provincial government is able to, uh, certainly to set prices, and perhaps uh, that, that's an arguable point. But uh, the, the one that bothered us, it appeared to say that no provincial government could regulate the rate of production of any resource which was going to enter into interprovincial or international commerce, and that's just devastating. In other words, to put it without being legal about it, yeah. in British Columbia terms, yeah. it might have said of BC, you've got all that coal on the ground, and you, the province of British Columbia, cannot decide how much coal you will dig or will not dig from now on. 
That's right, if it's going to uh, go to Alberta or to, or to Japan. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's a pretty serious thing because all of our governments want to run uh, conservation programs. We want to set a rate of production. We want to stretch uh, it out. That was the issue. Though. That's right. That really was the issue. And got whole who, towns depending on it. Who controls the resources? Right. And you made the point, certainly not the Supreme Court of Canada. Well, uh, yeah, that's right. We didn't attack the Supreme Court because... But, you uh, wouldn't, no, but, but, but we certainly attacked the decision. Of the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah, right. This... Uh, be, then became one of your principal issues at the Constitutional Conference yes, recently. Yes, indeed. Uh, our, our main presentation was that we should have a restructuring of the Constitution and that so far as the province is concerned, we should have the right to deal with our resources in the way that everybody thought we had the right ten years ago. Now, is, is Trudeau on the verge of giving that right at all? For, to you and the other provi provincial premiers? Well, I I at the conference he, he did undertake to, uh, he put up a short list of proposals which he was prepared to negotiate, and it included uh, the, uh, uh, the control of resources issue and a couple of subsidiary issues, direct and indirect taxation, which was one of the problems, and uh, interprovincial trade and commerce, which was another problem associated with the resource control. He put all three of those on the list and said, uh, we are prepared to amend the Constitution in those you, areas. One can understand Trudeau's position, or any f federal position in a way. We didn't finish up with ten all-powerful provincial potentates who control everything without leaving anything for the federal government to control. I think you make a good point, and I, I think the provinces should understand that the federal government really has to have a piece of the pie. We have to have a federal government which uh, has the legal power and the financial muscle to keep our economy as one united economy. We can't, we can't have ten economies. We're small enough in the world as it is but with if, one Canadian economy. If we economy. take that ton of your potash, and you own half the potash, you yes. bought half the potash, right. didn't you? Yes. Or we take the ton of BC coal, you have no objection when it comes out of the ground at your rate of production and is exported, say, to Japan or Ontario, if the federal government takes a tax at the border. No, I, I, my, uh, we, we just say that, uh, no, we don't object, but we think we, they should do it more or less for all resources and not do too much picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. uh, as we always say, uh, 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 when oil goes across the border, it, uh, it, it attracts a tax which goes to the federal government, which is fair game. But we would like to think that they would also tax uh, electric power, which was exported from Quebec and Ontario, but somehow it never gets taxed. Why is that? Uh, well, uh, it is... As seen from the prairies, it looks like uh, the, the, that one energy so source is uh, different from another energy source because it comes from a province which has got a little more political clout. Right. If they're going to levy anything on your intra-provincial resources, they've got to do it on uh, energy sources, they've got to do it on them all. Well, yeah. Or uh, be a little more reasonable because, uh, 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 let me give one quick argument. They, they levy an export tax and they use the money to keep down the price of oil in the Maritimes. Right. Fair game. Uh, why do they want to keep down the price of oil in the Maritimes? Because uh, they use it to generate electric power and power costs are so high it impacts very, very hard on, on people who don't have money. But we say, and we said in a couple of federal provincial conferences, why not put a little small tax on, uh, on electric power generated and use that money to keep power rates down Especially in the Maritimes? Especially in Ontario. Yeah, back. because they, you, you, uh, how, how, come, how come the good people of Saskatchewan should be... Uh, should be using their resource to keep down the uh, price of electricity and, and gasoline in London, Ontario. They don't look like they need much social assistance from Saskatchewan. Fair enough. And of course, you were, you've also got the oil companies being very quiescent with you these days because yeah. they won a big Supreme Court of Canada case against you and you had already collected many millions of their dollars illegally. Uh, 500 million, which was... Uh, Illegally. Well, as it turned out, as it turned out, yes. And now they don't even want it back. Well, I think we'll work out an arrangement with them. Uh, what I, does uh, that mean, <laughs> that quiet little dog? <laughs> I think you mean you'll pass another law which uh, to we, keep the money? We've already passed a law, and we think that, uh, uh, that the oil companies uh, well realize that uh, their best interests do not lie in attempting to, to get all that money back because... Uh, Basic, our position is perfectly simple. Uh, the, the taxes they paid was the price of the oil, and we say well, we give them back the taxes if they'll give us back the oil. But if they want to keep the oil, we'll try to keep the money. <laughs>
Well, I, I think you're right. I, I, my predecessor, Ross Thatcher, used to say that uh, if you listed the hundred most important problems in the minds of Saskatchewan people, the Constitution would be 101. And I'm not sure he was wrong. And I'll give you another reason why it seems to uh, an, an observer like myself from a far distance, yeah. of course, one doesn't like to travel east. <laughs> um, with Levesque sitting there, a man who, my words, is determined to smash this country, how can you ever come to agreement on anything? Well, we certainly can't get an overall agreement while René Levesque is Premier and in his present frame of mind. He is simply not in a position, political position, to agree. He can't prove that, he can't agree that Canada works in this way. However... He, he doesn't want it to work, does he? No, exactly. But I think we could get a, a package which he would find it very, very difficult to say no to. Uh, he can't say... Uh, yes to a total package, but I think he could say yes to a parcel package on the grounds that it strengthened his position on, let us say, communications. And if he, if he rejected that, I'm afraid he would be giving, in his terms now, some hostages to fortune to, uh, to the Liberal Party and to Claude Ryan, and I, I think he might find himself in an awkward political But he position. would never agree to a formula to bring the Constitution back, would he? I don't think he can. I think he, he feels that his he just doesn't have the political room to move to say yes to that. Um, a very broad question. Here you are, the leader of a powerful social democratic government in Alberta. Davy lost yeah, out. Yeah, Who right. knows the next yeah, time. Yeah. Um, why is it, Mr. Blakeney, that there is such a pathetically feeble representation in Ottawa of the NDP? What? Are Canadians too smart, too affluent to go for the NDP? Well, I think. Do we have to? Do you, do the people have to suffer first? Well, I hope not. I, I think that the democratic socialism is the answer uh, in in combining the desire of people to have political freedom with the the, the deep desire of people to have more or less fair fair play when when uh, in divvying up the the wealth of the nation, the more or less equitable distribution of wealth. I don't think you can have vast differences in, in wealth and have a, a, st a stable country. And uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, wherever it's true, uh, there is instability. But we, we have suffered really from, uh, from the uh, belief in North America that there was no difference between, uh, between authoritarian communism and, and social democracy. Everybody in Europe knows that, that that's not true. In fact, that the, the real... You mean Canadians th still think if you were to talk about being present here as a delegate of the Socialist International 14th Congress, that they would think you were some kind of commie? Well, there's still some people in Canada who do. And if they look at Europe, they will see that the battle lines are drawn between, uh, between authoritarian communism and... Uh, the and, social democrats. Uh, yeah, that's right. And we hear have here delegates from Czechoslovakia and Poland who are pleading for uh, for uh, for support. So therefore, you're telling Mr. me, Mr. Blayton, and I'm going to twist your answer, yeah, yeah. that the NDP is in a poor federal state because people think they're commies. Well, uh, in, in part, that's true. Uh, th this is being lived down. Uh, mind you, a good deal of, uh, of money has been spent on fostering that belief. Some of our minds go back to 1945 and the, the Gladstone Murray and the Trust Trail uh, uh, campaigns to, to blacken the name of democratic socialism in North America. But that's a long time ago and that's being lived down and uh, I think that gradually people are accepting the proposition that, uh, that we can have uh, 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 equality of more or less economic equality and we can have it along with political democracy and that's the best way to build society. You're perhaps the wrong man to put this to but I think that uh, basically the working man in Canada, the ordinary yeah. man who works for a living, yeah is afraid of all your socialist feather-bedded bureaucracies. Well, he may be, but... Uh, properly so? Uh, properly so in, 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 in having uh, apprehensions about any bureaucracy, but, uh, but our, our government, for example, runs a, a tighter ship than, let's say, the neighboring province of Alberta. We have fewer civil servants per thousand Saskatchewan people. How about compared to Ottawa? Well, uh, yeah, well, Ottawa, I don't even uh, look at that problem. I, I, I would have thought that a democratic socialist government could could do as good a job as is done in Ottawa, which wouldn't be very difficult at the moment, and have uh, not more but fewer public servants. Do your public servants have uh, an unfettered right to strike in Saskatchewan? J yes. Unfettered? Just about, yes. How yes. many times have you had to call the legislature back into session to order them back to work? Uh, once in our term. Teachers? Once, once in seven years. No, this with power workers. Power workers. Will you be happier dealing with Joe Clark after Trudeau, as I'm sure you believe, is wiped out in the next election? 
I don't know about that. I'll, 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 you don't? I, no. Can you predict that? Oh, uh, w with respect, I would... That Trudeau will be wiped out? I, I predict that Mr. Trudeau will not be Prime Minister after the next election. Uh, that either because the Liberals change their leader or alternatively because Clark is elected and, uh, and either could happen. And uh, 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 I think you're probably right. Mr. Clark is probably going to be elected. Uh, but uh, with respect to whether or not I'd sooner deal with him, I don't know. Mr. Trudeau is, is bright and able. He hasn't been able to get a team around him, which, it, which it makes it easier, easy for, uh, for provinces to deal with. Uh, Mr. Clark is an unknown quantity. Uh, I always find it a little difficult to deal with, uh, with conservative governments in, at Ottawa uh, in, in the previous uh -huh. regime, even though Mr. Diefenbaker was favorable to our interests. I never could quite figure out what they wanted to accomplish and how they wanted to go about it. They didn't seem to have a, 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 a line of, uh, of policy which I could follow, but we'll see when Mr. Clark gets there, if in fact he does. Well, uh, perhaps if there's a reawakening of social conscience in this country and uh, NDP is properly accepted, you would be the natural one to go on to Ottawa. Well, that's very kind of you to say so, but I, I'm, uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm uh, trying to do a, a little job there in Saskatchewan and uh, we've got some things that we need to do and we're, we're, we're trying Just to, to see... Just to finish on the joust, would you or wouldn't you? What? Well, my, my answer is no. I, I, I fancied myself uh, as a provincial premier uh, at Ottawa. I would uh, likely be in opposition, and I think I'm probably a better administrator than I am a proselytizer. One more final question. You can't hardly blame, as we say in this country, yeah. Chrétien and Trudeau for trying to cut down on these open-ending sheer costs, right? Agreed. Which is going to hit hard at your... Uh, very widespread social wealth, uh, you know, social care scheme in Saskatchewan. How can you meet that one? Oh, I'm not, not very, we don't get any more money per capita than you do in BC. So. Oh, I know, but they're all going to suffer, but you, you might perhaps feel it more strongly than a free enterprise premier somewhere in the West. Oh, anybody feel, any premier feels it strongly when he hasn't got money coming in. And, uh, and uh, we have probably uh, more ability to replace that money with other sources of funds than any other government in Canada except Alberta. And so we are not going to be disturbed by that. We are disturbed rather by any weakening of uh, of what I might call national standards, which are available in health care or hospital care or, or general welfare programs, we'd want to see more or less uh, the same standards available to all Canadians in, in rich provinces like British Columbia and in less rich provinces like Newfoundland. And equally rich provinces like Saskatchewan. Uh, kind of you to say so, but we're not there yet, Jack. We hope to be. <laughs> I think Mr. Blakeney says a secret little prayer of thanks at night to the Supreme Court of Canada for the Potash decision, which gave him the issue by which, and it's quite incredible, he wiped out the once strong liberals. Next we're going to talk about our contribution to Alcohol Awareness Week in a way that you don't see on the government's commercials about the problem. What are you going to ask me? I'm going to ask you what the hell you were doing yeah. in the drunk tank. Okay. 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 The provincial government recently launched its Alcohol Awareness Week. Deadly serious and it was very good. The commercials on alcohol as a drug are most impressive. And uh, they've done a lot. Let's not kid ourselves. They've got 28 outpatient clinics for alcohol and other drugs. They've got six detox centers funded with a total of 128 beds. And the people in them are not scabby, they're not covered in vomit, they're not ridden with lice. One is the Pender Street Detox, and the other is the brand new Maple Cottage in the grounds of Woodland where they have 24-hour care seven days a week. The number of residential beds and residential treatment center, and there are plans underway for a new compulsory detox to be opened somewhere or other. About 65 beds in it. Brian, that's all very well and good, but what's the difference between these places and the detox center that you spent two nights in? The difference there, they want to be cured. The, one you, the ones you were talking about. They want to be cured. Uh, they get the white glove treatment. Uh, come on in, nice and neat and tidy. Uh, let's get fixed up, spend a couple of days there. The difference with the drunk tank at the Vancouver jail, fifth floor, they don't want to be cured. Hardcore drinkers, all they want to do is get the next bottle. They don't want to be cured. How many people have died in that drunk tank recently that you know of? There's been two this year, mm -hmm. and the average is three to four each year. Now, there was one particular case which uh, made us look into this matter. What case was that? 
This involved the busiest day that the drunk tank has had this year and one of the busiest days ever. It was the Sea Festival weekend, the 27th and 28th of July. 133 people were booked into the drunk tank on that particular weekend, each of them uh, spending their four hours and then their uh, turned out on the street again uh, to whatever, go for another drink or whatever. And a man called David Nathan Brockman, 34 years of age, a chronic pill dropper and boozer. He was able to walk when he was booked in and he was okay when the check was made, but he was dead on arrival in hospital. And don't I recall that during the course of the inquest or the inquiry, it was suggested that he may have been smothered between the, among the bodies jammed into the drunk tank. That suggestion was made because, as you, as you know, there's uh, 133 people in there at, uh, on that particular day. As I understand it, there was uh, somewhere in the vicinity of about 20 in there, and it's a small, small room, as you'll see in the Something like the Black Hole of Kolkata. Now, you spent two nights there, didn't you? We spent uh, what, we were, what we thought would be a busy Friday. It turned out to be a quiet one. It was an off week, uh, no welfare checks, no payday, but still fairly busy. So then we went back. Then you went back. So first we're going to look at the quiet night at the drunk tank, and then we're going to look at a busy night in the drunk tank. So if Henry will roll the film on the quiet night at the drunk tank, we'll see what it's all about on a quiet night. This is a hotel. That's the name given this place by the chronic alcoholics who frequent Vancouver Skid Road. It's actually the fifth floor drunk tank of the city jail. It's early in the evening, and so far there's only one guest. But already, two floors down at the booking desk, other guests are signing in. Mm -hmm. What are your medical problems? Is this? Yeah. Yeah. Are you on any medication right now? Can you make out what you're saying? Do you have any medical problems, Mary? Yes, I do. What are they? Peter Dance. I beg your pardon? Peter Dance. Can I come in? Women like Mary make up a small percentage of the clientele at this hotel. They sleep it off in rooms on the fourth floor. Men like Henry are locked up on the fifth. We, we get the, the drunk, the, the dirty, chronic drunk that nobody else will handle. The worst kind? Yes. It's uh, 1000 to uh, 1300 a month. And uh, this, uh, this is split between the, the guys on the, that have the Friday or Saturday night out and uh, the chronic repeaters. Uh, these repeaters uh, may be in uh, four times a week. Uh, some days, if they got lots of money, they're in uh, twice a day. Of the drugs you bring in, what percentage of them would be what you call this chronic variety? About half of them. Fifty percent? Yes. yes. Are here all the time? Right. Uh, we know them by their first names, and uh, they know us very well. What, what can be done for these men? Well, um, there's nothing I think that we can do. We just, we just keep them long enough so that they're they can uh, probably cross the street on their own. And uh, what the city really needs is, is a center where they can be taken and, and dried out for uh, two or three days and so that they can, they can face the streets again. Where do you live, Henry? Where do you live? We got the resident tonight. The resident tonight. That's the boy. Bye, Henry. Uh, the, the vote now of, of mixing pills and alcohol. Um, 
men at the booking desk uh, receive additional training in first aid. And uh, they're taught to look at a man's eyes and his demeanor and to see if, in fact, uh, if he walked in, uh, suddenly he becomes very sleepy and lays down and it's hard to rouse. They're, they're told to uh, tell the medical nurse who come down and, and check them out and to his side whether, in fact, we should keep this man as a drunk or send him to the hospital. Is there a police policy of uh, who you pick up, uh, what drunk sort of qualifies to be uh, spending his four hours in the drunk tank? Uh, if the man is, is uh, somewhat capable of, of making his way home, then he's, uh, he's allowed to go. And uh, we certainly don't want to go back to the days where we picked everybody up for drunkenness and sent him to court. Mm -hmm. So he has to be pretty bad to get here? Yes, he has to be incapable of taking care of himself. Come on, that's a boy. I'm not drunk. I know that. I can tell. I can tell right away. I'm not drunk. I can tell that right away. Come on. Well, you're in here for drunk. Well, I'm not drunk. Well, it must be a mistake. Well, it must be a mistake, Henry. The guest list, in addition to Henry, looks very much the same night after night. A practicing dentist is signed in here, as have war veterans and war heroes. And Friday night's guest list even included the cousin of a judge. All have the same problem, overtaken by booze. We keep them for four hours, which uh, is really not long enough. Uh, some of them are not, not really sober by the time because they're very hard drinkers. But we feel it's, it's long enough to, to uh, you know, to let them face the streets again. The drunks are watched very closely. And each hour, a police nurse examines them individually. Sit down. Yeah. Sit down. Just sit down for a few minutes, OK? That's the stuff. Come on. That's the boy. Nobody should be in Now, you haven't got so far to fall, OK? You're fine. You're fine. You should take it easy with the booze if you're a, an epileptic. You know that. Guys, been in there for 18 hours. When are they gonna let him go? Could you check my room, please? Right in. The guy right yeah. over there. Why do you bring him in here? So-called four hours. He's no business here. He's got no business here. Hey, Henry, what's your middle name, Henry? Hepburn. Hepburn. Henry, have you been arrested before? Uh, never. <laughs> never. Never, never. I don't think. Oh. Hey, Henry, you got any marks, scars, or tattoos? Nothing. No. Yeah. He's clean. He's a clean liver. The men on the streets, while they're answering calls of, of, uh, of men down, quite often men who are, who are in case, drunk and incapable, they can't answer calls uh, on burglaries and other serious crimes. The police department would really like to get out of the business. Uh, if we could, if we could do that and just concentrate on the criminal charges, that would be ideal. You're not helping them at all here. I don't feel we are. We're just uh, we're not even drying them out as as uh, the courts used to. A facility, a detox center that's going to go in next year, uh, long overdue. Oh yes, very long overdue. It's. Uh, at least there they will get some kind of detention and treatment. Here it's just a re revolving door on a policy. And antiquated facilities? Well, certainly we're 25 years old here, and uh, I think that um, people expect different conditions nowadays. The system isn't working. Police aren't helping the drunks, and they're not in a position to help themselves. The Vancouver Police Department has been trying for 10 years to turn the babysitting job of drunks over to somebody who can help. They hope to have a detoxification center next year that will achieve that end. As it is now, the drunk tank is a disgrace. The chronic alcoholics leave here still in a state of intoxication with one thought on their mind. Where's the next drink? A few will be back in a matter of hours. Others will be back at their hotel tomorrow. Next, Brian, you're going to take us to a dirtier night at the drunk tank, and then you and I will have a minute or two to come up with what we think should be done, right? A payday. <laughs> Well, 
Wait till the stand up's over and then Mike's That's after the stand up. Yeah, tell him promo phones at the end. Okay. It'll be Henry on the phone here. I saw my picture of the television. Ryan Cosford, what's next on a drunk tank report? October 27th, it's a welfare weekend, a payday weekend, and it's busier. Okay, let's roll the film for the busier night at the drunk tank, and we'll fill as we go. See what's happening there this time round. Well, Jack, here it is again Friday night. Again, we're at the drunk tank. Part of a facility that hasn't been renovated for 25 years. This is one of the drunk tank units. It's early in the evening. So far, it's empty. But it's a welfare payment weekend, also a payday. It promises to be full as the evening progresses. Come on, let's go. This is uh, uh, another drunk, but uh, one who makes the trip quite frequently. He's used to this wagon. Did you see any repeaters come back in the same night? We saw some come in, and uh, they were put out about four hours later. An hour later, they were back. You're coming to the hospital with us. You'll let them go and check you out, Bob, first, OK? Come on, Pop. Let's go towards that elevator, okay? This chap uh, is a chronic repeater. He's 80 years old. Good old soul. See, in the good old days, as the policeman said in your first interview, sent them off to Ocala to save their pension money and dry out, and they came back healthy. January 26th. Well, no, we know what stopped that. Uh, the courts were overloaded. Eh? Right. They don't charge them anymore. You just hold them and release them. Come on, wake up, answer the question. Wake up and answer the question or something. As you can see, some of the people have to be handled with rubber gloves, and it kind of speaks for itself. Sure does. Well, you know, alcohol awareness. Let people see it as it is. This is the one. This is the one that bothers me. It really does. When you first showed me that, I said, we can't show that. And you said, yes, we can. Why can we show it? At first, we would think that this uh, particular individual would be a spastic, an epileptic, and he's uh, in the midst of a fit. But uh, just prior to him going into his routine, uh, he was checked out by uh, the police nurse. And uh, she, in turn, gave the word to the sergeant, who said, uh, no, he's just drunk. There's no medical problem. And it turned out uh, he was just faking it. They took him upstairs. They found a knife on him. That's his routine? Yeah. Well, who would be a policeman in the drunk tank? They trade them off every six months because it's a, it's a, a shift that uh, is not that desirable. That's oh, not sure. that desirable. It's abominable. But I think we've got some suggestions to make. Some of your, your regular scheduled type alcoholics will come in. He's uh, defecated himself. He's, uh, he's wet from the waist down with urine. Um, it's covered from uh, the head down and uh, head lice, body lice. Some of them are, uh, have injuries uh, that are septic and uh, gangrenous and, uh, you know, generally just uh, a mess. And if they can't get in as a drunk, they'll use other methods to get in, i.e. break a window or cause a disturbance or something on the street to ensure that they do get picked up. Around about 11 o'clock at night and uh, they've got a bed for the night. A pretty disgusting mess, isn't it? Yeah, on the whole it is, yeah. You find it gets to you? Yeah, it does. It gets to you. That's why, um, it's, you know, it's not a good idea to be up here for, uh, for any length of time, you know. It definitely has an effect on the, the young policeman. How many drunks were booked in that particular night, Brian? 62, and uh, although it was a busier night than the first night we went, uh, it's, it was really sort of like a quiet payday weekend because uh, it wouldn't be uh, unheard of to have 80, 90 through there in a night. You can imagine how it was the night of the Sea Festival weekend when they had how many drunks in there? 133. 133. CNB with collars and ties? 
Big pardon? Anybody with collars and ties? There were no well. Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah, as a matter yeah. of fact, uh, you know, uh, all wondering why they were there. And uh, what a sobering effect for somebody who's never been in there. All of a sudden, you're rammed into this uh, 20 by 20 tank, and there's two of them. And uh, all these people lying out, uh, chronic drunks, uh, some in a you have know, messed themselves up. And it's still a lot better than it used to be in the bad old days, but it's still horrible. And Brian and I will have some suggestions as to how it might be tackled after this break. How many drunks in a year in that tank? 15,000. Used to be 30,000, didn't it? Yeah, that was under the uh, old law when the, the Liquor Control Act, when they could charge you and they could uh, take you away, dry you out in a facility. And of course, the courts got too full, so they changed the law. It's the Summary Convictions Act now. So now we pick up 15,000. Yeah, put them in what, there for four hours. Who are, I know the police want properly to get rid of much of this problem. Who should go into that drunk tank? I mean, in fact, in your, your view. The violent ones, the ones that uh, you couldn't control in a detox center, uh, they might start a fight, and there's, uh, there's plenty of fighting in that tank. And um, ones that they might pick up for obstructing or, or any other crime that they want to question later. Words, what you're saying is that the only people who should go in are those who are really violent, one, and two, those who must be questioned by the police in connection with other offenses committed while they were drunk or involved in their drunken behavior in some way or another. Right, an estimated 50% of, uh, of the time and effort uh, in that jail goes into dealing with these drunks. Well, now I see on the note I got from the Alcohol and Drug Commission that this, this new detox center they're going to open, where is it? It's on Great Northern Way. That's going to be, that's the old dog pound. That's right. It's going to be compulsory. In other words, compulsory treatment in that detox center. Well, might not that not help, or will they go to the jail first before they go there? Depends whose uh, definition of the word compulsory you're looking at, because uh, uh, it'll be handled by uh, sheriff's deputies. And uh, if they're, they're in a situation where they feel that this particular person is violent, and now he may not You've be... You've got to be joking. He may not be violent according to... Are uh, they going to pick them up from the police and take them there? Yeah. But well, their, de their definition of uh, whether this guy is violent or not, uh, it, it may be they'll just ship him right back to the... Well, they would mountain. trouble handling violent criminals, far less violent drunks, haven't they? Oh, that's for sure. Anyway, it might be a step in the right direction. We we'll want to give it all the boost it can. Because the object of the exercise is to reduce the number of people jammed into those filth... Well, they become filthy. They're clean to begin with drunk tanks. And it's the first and probably the last time you'll ever do a stand-up for television beside a urinal. Urinal, isn't it? I hope so. Any phone calls, Linda? Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. My name is Newman. I used to work in Ocala. Yes, sir. I worked down in uh, Westgate B in the old dorm, and we used to have tier eight for the, the old alcoholic. Yeah. And you see a result there of these old guys. They're just dying because of some do-gooders, right? Well, in other words, your policy, and this has been said before, our policy now kills the old alcoholics off much quicker. That's right, because when the old guys came in, we used to see, you know, there was two guys looking after them on the dorm, except on the graveyard shift when there was one. Uh, you know, we used to rush them to the hospital, and all of a sudden they changed the act, and these old guys, you know, you don't dry them out in four hours or four days. I mean, really and truly, some of these guys we dealt with had six and seven hundred times. But we're not going to go back to that system, Brian, are we? We're not going to put people back in the bucket I mean, for alcoholism. They just, yeah. you know, the system they've got right now was set up by bureaucrats and people that really don't know what they're doing. You'd rather see them go somewhere to dry out compulsively? I would because, uh, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Don't know. Thanks for your call. Go ahead, please. No, this one. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Good morning. Good morning to you, too, and to Brian. I, um, we experienced several trips through those places myself, and, uh, I found that uh, the treatment I got was always fair, but uh, something to be desired in the way of uh, human. Well, I mean, how can, you can't really blame the police for it, I don't no. think. No, I know I don't, but I just want to say that uh, it's developed for me that uh, through following the advice of someone in Ocala who once told me that if I put my energies to... Uh, Are you okay now? Have you beaten the problem? Have you, yes, beat, have you beaten the problem? Years of drink. Best of luck. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. I'm an epileptic. Yes, sir. And uh, I had uh, one experience where I was placed in uh, the tank 
Yep. For the four-hour period that they're talking about, it was from Friday night. Did you have a seizure during that time? I had it. I well, I so I was trying to say I was in an epileptic seizure when I was picked up as drunk. Well, that can happen. That was why Brian made. But Brian, just just tell me uh, the circumstances of that man whom the police and the nurse were con convinced was feigning. Okay, he was in. Uh, when you get booked in on the third floor. Uh, uh, usually there's a crowd at a busy time, so they put you in a little holding tank off to the side. And uh, he started to hyperventilate, so they called a nurse. And the nurse came in, uh, checked him out, looked at his eyes, uh, checked him over. And it was uh, her conclusion that uh, he was strictly was They don't strictly have a full-time doctor there, do they? They have uh, a couple of doctors that come in in the morning. And uh, they're available to look at the drunks uh, if there's a problem, but uh, not as a rule of thumb. Well, I'll agree with this caller. There's always a danger that an epileptic may be picked up as drunk uh, and treated as drunk, which is bad. But on this one, we have the assurance of the police that the man was feigning. And I hope you had a better experience than that, than that in the jail cell. We might also point out that that's one of the positions of the police department is that... Uh, they don't you know, want them. They're not doctors. You know, uh, they, they're just they're making a judgment that this person is drunk. Brian, just to sum up, uh, from what your police told you and what you know yourself, who should go into that drunk tank? Just, I mean, how much would it cut down the population of the drunk tank if they took away the straight drunks and left only the violence and the criminals? For those being questioned for crime. 20% probably less? That would be left. 80% yeah. would be out of the way in a compulsory detox center. Most of them are just drinkers, happy drinkers, but they're chronically ill. It's a miserable situation, isn't it? Who would want to be a policeman in the drunk tank? Would you? Nope. Not for all the tea in China? Two nights was enough. Two nights was enough. Sober, I might add. <laughs> well, that goes without saying. Okay. Thanks very much, Brian. I think that was an excellent report, and I, I think it shows people the problem. You can make all the clean drunk tanks you want in the world, but these many of these people, perhaps 80%, should not be there. <laughs> Just thinking, Brian, maybe we should uh, throw a clip of that dirty night at the drunk tank up to Volrich and Brown when they're here. Friday morning, is it, Linda? Volrich and Brown. Yes. And the other mayoralty candidates are May coming Brown, when? And the others are coming on Thursday, the 9th. Thursday. What do we have for tomorrow? Well, tomorrow we have an interview with Ian McCardo, who was the British MP from Bethnal Bowl Green in England, as well as the school board candidates, a selection of them, not all of them. Two, four... Six. That's right. Okay, Beth Noble, Green, Ian Ricardo. Very funny, very bright interview. And the uh, school board candidates from COPE, NPA, and what's the other one? COPE, NPA, and team. team. Now, just to finish the program. At the start this morning, I urge you to write to Isabel Kimmett about the long-term care. If you know anything of these facts, write to Isabel Kimmett or write to Webster with your knowledge of any bad treatment in long-term care homes in British Columbia.